So today I want to talk about um, monoliths and microservices uh, and why you might consider building your next microservice in a language called um, Elixir. So a fair bit of warning, there's quite a bit of code in this talk um, and I don't think the screen is super, uh, super clear. So if you want to follow along, um, you can take a look at the slides which I've uploaded here, Elixir-microservices. Uh, if anyone wants to take a photo, I'll leave it up for a few seconds. Okay. So first of all, my name is Lauren, uh, also known as Sugar Pirate with an underscore, uh, or Potato on GitHub. Uh, as you can tell, I love food. And I'm here today because of my many very valuable skills, which include uh, dad jokes, having an extensive knowledge of Star Trek, uh, and also being Australian. So I actually lived there for seven years. Uh, and I actually uh, I learned a lot of survival skills uh, because Australia is a very dangerous place. All the spiders are like this big, it's super scary. Um, but that also means I can survive anywhere on Earth, which is why I live in California. Um, and I have a little dog. Her name is Zelda. Uh, she actually does all the coding for me. I just take the credit. And because of these very highly valuable skills, I work at a company called Netflix. Uh, you might have heard of us. Uh, on applications that power the world's largest studio. So come speak to me later if you're interested in what we're up to. All right, so microservices, very hot right now. Yes? Oh, the link? Uh, you have to see all the other photos again. So yeah, I've uploaded the slides here. If you if you just walked in, um, you can take a look at the slides. So it's Elixir dash microservices and Bitly. All good. Okay. All right. So Netflix and microservices. All right. Microservices are so hot right now, right? You cannot go to a conference without hearing about microservices. So I apologize. Um, but why am I talking about microservices? So firstly, Netflix is very well known for microservices, as you might have seen in Ian's talk just now. And we've open sourced a lot of tools around such architecture. Um, for example, we have Visceral, which is a WebGL-based visualization tool for traffic data. And if you provide it with a graph of nodes and edges, it can um, give you a lot of insight into how traffic flows in and out of your system. So this is a uh, fictional data, but it, it sort of gives you a visual look at how a microservice uh, architecture might look like in the real world. Then we have a service-based registry for AWS called Eureka. Uh, and then we have a very popular circuit breaker library in Java called Hystrix. So I apologize, I don't think it's very readable here. Um, but you can say that we are very ser uh, serious about microservices and this kind of architecture has enabled us to scale rapidly and grow uh, over the years. But one thing I do want to stress though is that uh, we transition to a microservices architecture really out of necessity. And it only really makes sense if your company or organization is large enough. It's really important to remember that microservices are definitely not a silver bullet. Um, and if you're starting out a brand new project with a microservice architecture, then it might not necessarily be the best choice. And in an ever-evolving industry like technology, uh, perhaps the one truth in our industry is that there are no silver bullets, right? Um, there isn't going to ever be one technology or one pattern or one framework that will somehow miraculously guarantee you success in your business. And it's also very easy to assume that uh, technological choices are the only reason why a, su a business is successful, which is completely false. You know, just because a company has become successful because uh, uh, sorry, just because a company has become successful and they use microservices does not mean that they became successful because they use microservices. So it's definitely not um, that kind of relationship. So before I go into the Elixir part of my talk, I want to cover some of the very common fallacies and misconceptions about microservices. So first of all, it is true that you can make applications faster if you reduce the number of things that this application does. But it takes a lot of effort to make this system as a whole faster and more stable. So for example, with microservices, you have now introduced uh, network latency in between many of your calls. And what used to be uh, synchronous is now asynchronous. And you know that networks are almost never reliable. And when it comes to the performance of a monolithic application, it, it usually depends, but it's almost um, never uh, CPU or memory. But in most cases, it's actually going to be I.O., especially if you're first setting out on a project. 
And if you introduce more network calls to your uh, profile, then uh, adding more I.O. is only, only going to make you slower, uh, slow down more. The next fallacy is that microservices will somehow autom automatically make your code cleaner, like somehow magically. And of course, if you're rewriting an application from a monolith to a microservice, um, and uh, then you have of, uh, the benefit of hindsight, right? Because you're rewriting an application and you have a better understanding of the domain now. Um, but the truth is that you don't actually need to switch to microservices to write cleaner code. You can already do that. It's, it's not a one-to-one -one relationship there. So in the case of Elixir, um, there is a feature called Umbrella Applications uh, that will allow you to organize services in your app as separate applications. And this will allow you to scale productivity in a, 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 growing, a rapidly growing team without actually having to build out very complicated infrastructure for your organization. So I'm going to talk more about this later. And then next, it's also true that it's simpler to write isolated services that do uh, only one thing and one thing well. But the problem is that many business domains cannot be cleanly divided into neat little boxes. And while you have gained application simplicity in each of these little microservices, what you've gotten in return is an increase, uh, a huge increase in infrastructure complexity. So for example, your microservices now need to reach out to other services that it might not necessarily know about to request and store data, as an example. And once you need to do this, if, for example, you need to uh, you know, commit uh, some data over multiple services, then you have distributed transactions, which are a whole thing in itself. And you don't really want to go there if you don't have a large team that is equipped to solve these kind of problems. So what should you do? Again, I want to stress, uh, microservices really only make sense for when you have grown large enough. I mean, it's a really cool um, idea and pattern, but your organization may not need it. So it's an important point to consider. And instead, it's actually worth considering sticking with your monolith in some cases and then focusing on, on the important stuff like getting to product market fit and so forth. Um, and if performance is becoming an issue, then you know, go back and fix your technical debt. Uh, because microservices, again, they don't guarantee performance. You still have to do a lot of work to actually get microservices to where you want them to be. Um, and it's important to remember that it's usually almost never about the technology. Um, microservices are really an organizational uh, optimization. So at Netflix, um, apart from microservices, we are also very well known for our corporate culture. And one thing we stress a lot is freedom and responsibility. Um, and because of this culture, uh, microservices actually play to our strengths. So similarly for you, if you consider transitioning to a microservice architecture, you need to consider how your organization's culture uh, needs to evolve and grow. Because unless your culture is ready for it, uh, microservices will probably slow you down. Because now everyone is like split up into these little groups that are isolated and very uh, loosely coupled. Uh, so your organizational culture will need to be able to adapt and uh, grow and evolve to that change. So after all that scary talk, um, let's say you still want to transition to microservices, you still need it. So today in this talk, I want to actually tell you uh, why you might consider using this language called Elixir to build uh, your next microservice. As a small disclaimer, we don't uh, use Elixir in Netflix yet. Uh, uh, we don't have any production uh, apps in Elixir yet. Um, so what I'm about to sh share are my personal views. Um, but if I were to start a new project today, I would definitely consider Elixir uh, for uh, a lot of different use cases. Um, but at the same time, you know, Elixir is not a silver bullet either. It's great for some use cases, but not so great for other use cases. So let's take a quick look at um, these things. Um, Elixir is really great if you're building, if you want to build uh, this like web API for your services, like the, the front facing part of your microservice architecture. And this is especially true if you need to do anything that's soft real time. So for example, something like a chat bot or a chat application or a collaborative editor like Google Docs. Um, something that requires a lot of uh, you know, like real time web socket connections, uh, a lot of real time, like many, many concurrent connections especially. And if there is a certain part of your stack that needs high availability, then it's also worth considering Elixir or Erlang. So wow, that's very green. Um, fault tolerance is a first class citizen in Elixir. Um, and there are a lot of tools available for you built into the language itself that help you design and build systems that can almost live forever. Almost live forever. 
Uh, Elixir is also really great for building systems that need to be concurrent, uh, since Elixir is built on top of the Erlang virtual machine. Uh, that means you have decades of experience with uh, building concurrent systems for telephone applications that are available for you to use as well. And of course, Elixir is a language where the developer experience is a first-class citizen as well, and the tooling is really excellent, and the nature of the language makes it very expressive. And this is also very red. <laughs> However, no language is perfect, and Elixir is not necessarily the best choice if you need to do something that requires heavy number crunching. You might want to do this in another language, like you know uh, Java or C++ or, or whatever. And then you can uh, figure out how to integrate that into Elixir, which I will actually go through uh, a little bit later. And if most of your system is very heavy uh, CPU-based, then perhaps Elixir is not really the best choice either. Uh, so things that are very sequential, an example, may not uh, necessarily see any benefit uh, in being uh, built in Elixir. So some typical examples of this might be, you know, like uh, image processing or signal processing or something like that. Uh, Elixir is built on top of the Erlang virtual machine, also known as the Beam, and Erlang has been around since the early 90s. It was designed to improve the uh, development of telephone applications, so uh, it powers a lot of phone switches around the world. Uh, you know, because telephones can, they're not supposed to go down. So actually some countries are required by law uh, where the, tele the telecom operators, they're not allowed to have their networks go down, uh, even in, in emergencies, because it's obviously absolutely critical that uh, telephones are still operating if, you know, there's an earthquake or something like that. So Erlang was designed from the ground up for this kind of, of, of situation and designed for uh, high availability. Erlang's strength and concurrency comes from its virtual machine, uh, the Beam. And typically, this will run as a single uh, operating system process with one thread per core. But this is configurable if you need to do any performance tuning. And when you spawn a process in Erlang, um, I actually want to stress that a process in Erlang is not the same as an operating system process. Um, these processes are preemptively scheduled by the beam uh, versus uh, a cooperative model. It's, it's actually preemptively, uh, preemptively scheduled. And what this means is that it's very cheap to switch context between all these little processes. Uh, the scheduler can, uh, you know, like they can interrupt tasks that the processes are running. It can resume them at a later time. And what this guarantees is that uh, one single process will never take down the entire system, and you can always, uh, you know, uh, terminate an unresponsive process. Processes also have dynamically allocated stacks, uh, so they start very small and they can grow uh, rapidly in size. And what this means is that you can spawn thousands and you know even millions of Erlang processes without uh, running out of memory. So processes are really Erlang's primitives for concurrent computation. And um, the way they communicate is actually very similar to the kind of like microservice communication that Ian just talked about uh, in his talk. So uh, processes communicate asynchronously uh, without any locks. Uh, they don't share any mutable state at all. Um, and actors can even spawn more actors to do uh, more work. So you can think of this like almost like uh, miniature load balancing in a way. And you can even trap exits from a process uh, to figure out like, like why did this process terminate, um, uh, when did it terminate, and even uh, be able to restart it. And this is all built into the language. So in contrast, a general purpose programming language like Java, it was really designed to be run anywhere, right? And, and it wasn't really designed from the ground up uh, to be fault tolerant and concurrent. It's not really the constraints of the language. But the Beam languages, the Erlang virtual machine languages, they are meant to be run almost forever. And you can do this because in Erlang and Elixir, or any other Beam language, you can define supervision trees for these processes that can self-heal the process. So you know, if a process crashes, you can have a supervisor restart it for you. It, it has a, a lot of different strategies for um, handling uh, you know, process termination. And in Erlang, fault tolerance means to keep the whole system running, even if it means having to drop like one or two users. That's uh, it's actually preferred to drop a, a single user or a couple of users rather than to have to restart the whole system. So Erlang built, uh, gives you all these kind of tools uh, to handle failure. So um, like you know, like restarting processes, monitoring them, and so forth. But um, how can Erlang do this if other languages cannot? And the secret is actually how Erlang does its garbage collection. Um, so in contrast, Java depends on a single heap, uh, which lacks isolated state. Um, so Java cannot really provide the same level of fault tolerance to the level of Erlang, simply because of the way its uh, virtual machine does garbage collection. But um, Erlang uh, garbage collects each process individually, so uh, it can guarantee pr true process isolation and thus fault tolerance. Um, I think it's not working. <laughs> 
so Erlang is really designed to build systems that uh, can run forever, uh, self-heal, and scale as well. And because of these properties, it powers many commercial and open source projects, uh, including uh, very famously WhatsApp. So if you're interested in more details about the VM itself, uh, I highly recommend this talk by Sasha at Elixir Days called Solid Ground. It's one of my favorite talks on Elixir. And um, if you only ever watch one talk, um, then you should watch this one, not mine. <laughs> so I told you a lot about Erlang, but what about Elixir? So Elixir has a very approachable modern syntax that compiles to the Erlang virtual machine. But this is not just sugar on top of Erlang. Uh, Elixir is a functional language as well, uh, and it's fully compatible with Erlang. So all the libraries, all the modules that are built in Erlang, you can call directly from Elixir uh, without you know, having to write any glue code. Uh, it also features a very standard syntax and a lot of other really cool features. So I want to really quickly go through some of the basics of Elixir. At first glance, most of the syntax is very similar to Ruby, if you come from the R, uh, that kind of language. Um, but that's actually where the similarities end. So the first thing you'll notice that might be the first question mark here is this third uh, line. Um, this is actually pattern matching at work. So if, uh, unless you come from a, a background where uh, in a language with pattern matching, this might be very strange to you. Um, but what's actually happen happening here is that we're matching the left-hand side of the equals to the right-hand side. And because in Elixir, all lists, all of these arrays are linked lists, you can directly pattern match against a linked list and get the head of, of the list, which in, in this case is 1. And you can also get the tail of this list, which is 2 and 3. And for this reason, you'll notice that um, in, in Elixir and uh, in Erlang as well, a lot of functions tend to be recursive, uh, especially if you're dealing with um, lists like this. And because it's a functional languages, there are obviously no classes or any kind of object orientation uh, in, in this language. There's really only functions and modules, which are really just functions under a namespace. And you can also pattern match on functions as well. So in this case, um, we have this sum function, which will only match on a list with three items. And if you pass in more than three items, it's actually going to give you a compiler error, uh, which is actually, uh, it might seem annoying at first, but you will come to really love this feature. Another thing I really like in Elixir is the pipe operator. So um, here we have three nested function calls, which um, you know right now they can, they're still sort of readable. But once you get uh, started nesting more and more function calls, it's going to be very hard to read. Um, and the pipe operator lets you rewrite what I just wrote uh, there as something like this, where each pipe, this uh, little strange triangle symbol, uh, will pass the value from the first function uh, to the next function as its first argument. Now, again, that might just seem like simple syntactic sugar, right? It's just a, a knife to have. But it's really more than that, because one of the obvious benefits is that it sets you up to write really small functions. And it makes you start thinking of, of your code as, as data transformations. And it gives you a, a very composable way to define these kind of data transform, uh, de transformations. And when you combine uh, the pipe operator with pattern matching, it becomes even more powerful. And you'll realize that you almost never need to use conditionals like um, other languages. Now, when I was first learning Elixir, I think pattern matching was probably one of the most, like, the strangest things to understand. But once you get it, it's really intuitive. And um, if you're like me, you'll actually be like, why doesn't every language have pattern matching? Because it's so awesome. Um, so here, um, if you're familiar with JavaScript, um, then uh, this might be maybe a little bit easier to understand. So uh, in, pa in Elixir, pattern matching is similar to destructuring, except that it also does value matching and type checking. And here we have these two strange looking functions. I seem to be defining it twice. But what's really happening is there's, there's only one function, except that it matches two kinds of input. So the first kind of input is if it's an empty string, then it's just going to uh, give send me back an error message. Uh, and if it's not, if it's not an empty string, if it's anything else, then I'm just going to pass through the value because uh, this validate presence method, it is, it is correct. It's, it's present. Um, so pattern matching really forces you to think about your data first. What are the possible values this function might receive? And then how do I want to handle them? So Elixir makes this very explicit for you. Uh, and again, because Elixir is a compiled language, it makes for a really nice developer experience. And if you come from a background of a strongly typed language, then um, between pattern matching and type specifications, which is another feature in uh, Elixir, I don't think you'll miss uh, strongly, strongly typed language too much. <laughs> 
uh, railway oriented programming is also possible in Elixir. Um, this, is a, this is a composable way to, composable way to handle success in data in a pipeline of data transformations. Uh, and you can even match against errors, which it makes for a very robust experience. So here, uh, I've almost this is almost pretty much like a state machine in, in this like little uh, whiff block, uh, which you can read more in the slides later. So out of all the language features in Elixir, I have to say this is probably one of my most favorite. Uh, it's become very intuitive, and again, I wish all languages had it. And as a really quick uh, real-world example, this is an MP3 ID3 tag parser. Uh, that's all there is to it. And the way it works is it will actually uh, match parts of the binary for you. So you can actually pattern match directly on bits in this binary, which is kind of incredible. So uh, have a look at this link later uh, if you want to check out the code. So there's a whole lot more to Elixir. I've only really scratched the surface there. Uh, you, can, you can check out more if you're interested uh, in my introduction to Elixir in, in another talk where I talk about more of the basics. Um, and another thing I wanted to highlight as well is uh, metaprogramming. It's another first-class citizen in Elixir. Um, and uh, actually, Elixir itself is written in uh, a lot of macros. But let's get to the more exciting part of, of, of this talk. So those features I just covered, they're actually, to me, the least interesting parts of Elixir. Uh, Elixir's strength is really the fact that it's a Beam language, right? And hence, it can take advantage of all these uh, all the decades of experience in, in working with Erlang and getting concurrency right. So let's walk through some simple concurrent programming in Elixir, uh, assuming you can see the code. So here we have an example of a very simple queue. Um, we're going to use this part of the Elixir standard library called the gen server, a generic server, which is a set of behaviors in uh, the standard library to implement the server of a client-server relationship. Uh, a gen server will start a process for you, an Elixir process, and this means that it can be supervised, it can be restarted, and so forth. And um, the reason why these are behaviors in the language, uh, or like, or really they are just interfaces, is because uh, this means that all these processes will have a very standard interface and include ways for you to trace and do error reporting, for example. So I don't want to talk about too much of the implementation details of that queue, but here is a very simple example of me running the queue in the console. So when I first start the queue on, on line one, you'll see that it gives me back a tuple with uh, an OK symbol and a process ID. Uh, and this will start a process for you and link it to your current process, uh, in this case, my console. And now you can enqueue and dequeue items like a normal queue without even knowing that this is running in a separate process. Uh, but if you try to run a function that doesn't exist uh, in this simple queue module, then this will actually crash your process and cause it to exit. And this is because we haven't told Elixir what we want to do when you know pattern, uh, functions don't match or like what Elixir should do when the process is crashed. So Elixir is just going to crash it for you. Um, and because processes are isolated, these crashes will never affect other parts of your system, which is really what you want when you're, you're working in a microservices environment. And if you, if you keep, keep trying to call functions on that same queue, then obviously it's going to fail again because the process ID no longer exists. But um, we're not really using Elixir to write stuff that crashes and doesn't recover, right? I mean, at least I hope no one is uh, intending to do that. So let's pair this generic server with a supervisor. Uh, with a supervisor, we can explicitly design for fault tolerance in our application itself. And here I have a very basic implementation that uses the one-for-one one strategy. And what this means is that if, it, if a child process that this supervisor is supervising crashes, then all it's going to do is just restart that single child process. Um, and there are other strategies as well, which uh, you can check out in the standard library. So now if we try th the same code again, um, then the process is still going to crash, but uh, you'll see at the bottom that when I call a queue uh, to get all the items in the queue again, it's still, it's still up and running. So this is a very simple example, but it's also very powerful because uh, it should give you some insight into how you can, um, you know, you can define these like really uh, complex uh, supervision trees that will explicitly let you design how your application handles failure. And as you learn more about Elixir, you'll start thinking in processes. So this is a pretty popular benchmark run by the Phoenix framework team. So Phoenix is a, a web framework for Elixir, similar to how Ruby on Rails is a web framework for Ruby. Um, and in this blog post, they talked about how they managed to handle 2 million concurrent WebSocket connections on a single machine. That's 2 million WebSocket connections on a single machine. That's pretty insane. 
And what's really happening is that um, if you think in processes, this is not just one machine. It's really two million separate lightweight processes that are managing one web so socket connection each. So that, that was really cool. Um, and Elixir is obviously also designed to work well in a distributed environment. So you know you can do load balancing in your application uh, across multiple nodes that you can spin up yourself in a cluster. Um, so here, let me go through a really basic example. Um, here, I've started three terminal sessions. Uh, just pretend for a moment that these are three s completely separate uh, servers. And um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to run this function called node list. And right now, this first terminal is going to just give me an empty list, right? Because we're not connected to anything else. Um, so if I try to connect to the second one, my second terminal, then it's going to form a little uh, mini cluster here. So now if I do node list again, I will get um, the other node in my cluster. And now these uh, two nodes can communicate bidirectionally. And I also want to add that this is actually just all part of the Erlang standard library. I haven't installed anything. This is like bare bones Erlang. And if we connect our third shell to the first one, or even the second one, any one of them in that cluster, then it will join the cluster and uh, it's automatically connected to every other node in this cluster to form a meshed network. So now that all three nodes are connected, um, you know, I can do all sorts of crazy things like uh, dispatch calls to all of these nodes and then um, get all of the results back. So here is a simple hello world example. I'm just going to print hello world and then just collect it back in the calling node. Um, so that's pretty obvious there. Um, and then here's a, probably a, a better example uh, where I'm getting the process ID from each of the nodes. So you can actually tell that this is really running on each separate node. And of course, you can also call single um, functions on, on sorry, you can call functions on single nodes in a cluster. Um, and there are a lot more uh, useful built-in functions in the Erlang standard library. Uh, this is actually none of this is actually Elixir yet. This is all Erlang. Me calling this Erlang libraries from the Elixir console. Um, so uh, if you want to read up more on distributed applications and do some kind of like load balancing within a little service itself, then you can check out the Erlang standard library. Uh, it's probably not the best kind of layout to read. Uh, it's a bit old school. Um, but there is a lot of info in here, and there are also a lot of tutorials and blog posts uh, online that will tell you how to do uh, distributed uh, clusters on, for example, you know, like EC2 or like uh, Azure Cloud perhaps as well. Um, and you can even set up distributed Phoenix applications. Oh, I went too fast. Uh, you can even set up distributed Phoenix applications as well. Um, so you can also do that, and it's uh, it's actually a very short blog post. So it's kind of mind-boggling to see how a lot of very complicated uh, things in other languages are made, uh, I guess, simpler in Elixir and Erlang, because these are all first-class things. Now, in a microservices architecture, if you're not monitoring these services, then you're gonna you're you're setting yourself up for failure, because if a service goes down and it becomes unresponsive. Uh, then you, you can potentially take down like the whole of your, your architecture, especially if this service that went down is uh, very dependent upon by other uh, services. And the good news is that Erlang and Elixir have uh, world-class monitoring tools avail available for you to use. So here, this uh, observer module is, is again built into Erlang. I didn't install uh, any library. So this is one of the simplest ways to get started with monitoring. Um, and if you start your application with this interactive shell, you can uh, run the observer and just watch as like you know processes are running throughout your application. And of course, you know uh, like it's not useful to monitor unless you can also re uh, monitor remote nodes. So that's also a first class thing with the observer module. Um, and really here, what, what's really cool about the observer is that you can actually see how your application is running in, on, in, in, in the runtime layer. You can look at the processes that the applications have spawned. Uh, you can look at their supervision trees. You can look at the memory profile, CPU usage, and so forth. And you can even kill processes uh, that have gone rogue without ever affecting the rest of your system. So the contrast here is, if I if imagine if um, in another language I wrote a recursive function that never stopped, didn't have a base case because I made a typo. Um, in other languages, you will actually have to restart the entire server, right? But in Elixir, if you design it with processes, I can just terminate that single process without affecting the rest of my system. And again, this is only possible because of the way Erlang has designed for fault tolerance. Uh, the next tool is an open source one called Early Burly. Uh, it also has a graphical user interface. And one of the really nice things about this uh, program is um, this feature called uh, sequential tracing, which will actually allow you to uh, check out how processes are passing messages uh, across each other. So you can see how messages will flow through 
all the processes in your application. And of course, it also has you know like other nice things like memory viewers and so on. Uh, another recently open source tool is the Web Observer. Uh, this was open sourced by Square Enix. Um, do we have any uh, Square Enix Final Fantasy fans here? Cool. Um, so yeah, they use Elixir, and um, this tool that they open source implements a lot of the same monitoring features as um, the Erlang-based observer, but it makes it available to you uh, via a web uh, UI. And of course, there's also commercial tools like uh, Wombat from um, Erlang Solutions. It's a, it's a very good, uh, very comprehensive product that gives you a whole suite of features like metrics uh, and alarms and notifications and so forth. So earlier I mentioned that um, you know Elixir and Erlang aren't really the best for number crunching. Um, so there are, there's going to be a lot of times where you actually want to communicate with the outside world uh, in Elixir. And the good news is again Erlang has built-in support for interfacing with uh, Java here for example. Uh, this will require some work in your Java app um, but when you're done, then your Java application can communicate with all these uh, Erlang processes as well, which is really cool. And there are also bindings for other languages. Here we have a binding for Rust, so you can write uh, safe uh, native functions in the Rust language and then call them from Erlang or Elixir. Uh, and it's not really recommended, but if you need to, you can even drop down to C to write native implemented functions. Uh, but if you don't do this correctly, you can risk crashing the virtual machine if you're not doing it correctly. And um, I think this is actually very hard to get right. So most people don't uh, do this unless you really, really need to. All right, so um, we spoke a lot about Elixir, but um, what about microservices? Um, if, you're if you're not ready to transition to a microservice architecture, then uh, Elixir umbrella applications are a really nice way to improve the productivity in your team uh, without uh, getting all the infrastructure complexity of uh, traditional microservices set up. So if you're considering a, a new language for a new project or something like that, then this is one of the really great benefits of choosing uh, Elixir. So let's explore what this means. So first of all, what exactly is an umbrella application? The Elixir runtime has the concept of applications. And it, uh, what this means is that code in Elixir is packaged inside of these applications. Uh, which are started and stopped together as a unit. Uh, an Elixir application contains its supervision tree, its processes, and so forth. And if you think about it, it's really a way to organize your code in a single project as separate applications. So you get all the benefits, or most of the benefits, of microservices without incurring the same infrastructure cost. And when the time comes when you really do need to split out your uh, applications into separate services, then because you've already separate th separated them into separate service uh, applications, then it's a lot easier to do so. And there are many ways to organize your applications in an umbrella application. Um, one that is very frequently mentioned is domain-driven design, uh, which is really about designing software based on the underlying domain. But uh, you're not restricted to domain-driven design. It's really up to you to decide where the boundaries of your, your applications live. So um, as part of this talk, I wrote a little tiny uh, toy microservice called PD. Um, that uh, All it does is it watermarks a PDF and then sends it back to you via a callback. Uh, and I implemented it with four major pieces. So there is a web API. There is a little queue that I uh, that I'm another library that I'm using. And then there's the actual stamping and the watermarking of the PDF. So um, I want to show you like a real world example of what an umbrella application might look like. And the reason I wrote the web API as a separate application is really because um, in the Elixir world, at least, uh, you know, we, we tend to think of the web interface as just one of the interfaces that expo exposes your application code uh, through a REST API. So your application could potentially be called through other interfaces or other protocols like, you know, like uh, TCP or whatever other protocol you need to communicate to. So let's go through some uh, quick code examples. Um, we have a Phoenix application here. Um, the router will map your, uh, URLs to an endpoint. And in this example, I'm only going to expose uh, the really the, the major thing to look at is the documents controller, which will let you create and um, retrieve watermarked PDFs. Um, the controller itself is very simple. Uh, again, it, just, it only exposes two actions, a create and a, a show. Uh, to get and post respectively. And these, act uh, these actions don't really do much except call the interfaces that we've exposed in our watermarking application 
and then it does all like you know like typical uh, web controller stuff like return HTTP responses and so on. So the controller's logic here is really limited to what it knows about. Um, so you know things like uh, like whitelisting content types. So we only white watermark PDFs and not documents. Uh, enforcing required parameters and so forth. So really, my web API doesn't really know that it's part of a watermarking application. And all it really does is just pass the correct data to the interfaces that I've defined in my code. Um, and then passes it along to my queue as well. Um, I'm going to skip uh, that part. But uh, a callback, the, call, the way I implemented callbacks is through a concept with, uh, in, that's very common in Elixir uh, called clients. Uh, and this, what it, this does is it will make it very easy for me to swap the underlying implementation without uh, changing parts of my other code. So really, this is just about exposing um, you know, interfaces and being very explicit about what you expose. And one really nice side effect of this is that because Elixir is a functional language, it means that you don't really need to mock or stub things when you're testing, uh, because you can just pass in a dummy client, and um, your test will use that dummy client instead of the real client. So let's look at the queue now. Um, I have implemented another queue in the repo, but uh, for now in this uh, talk, I'm going to talk about this library called Tonic, which is very similar to Sidekick uh, if you come from a Ruby and Rails background. So it's just, a, it's just a, a job runner, like a worker queue that does stuff in the background. Um, and if you look closely in this queue code, I have uh, two functions again, watermark with. And uh, this is where pattern matching really shines, because I can handle uh, different kinds of edge cases in my code without really having to write a lot of, um, I guess, uh, you know, spaghetti code, I suppose. Um, and in this example, all I'm doing is exposing an option called ephemeral. So I, I, I give the user an option to whether or not they, they want to persist their water, uh, PDF to uh, like S3 or a database, because that PDF might be you know, a sensitive document. Then the queue, all it really does is uh, it just passes off the job again to the watermarker and stamper. So uh, you don't you you can probably write this better, but the idea is that you know these separate applications don't necessarily need to know about each other in a microservices environment, even within uh, a single umbrella application. And then here is uh, probably a little bit of implementation details, but um, the way we implement watermarking is we we create a layer with perhaps like a customer's name. Uh, and then we uh, you know, put it onto the actual PDF itself. Um, and the way the watermarker works is it will use different strategies um, to create these PDFs. So for example, um, the, first one, the first strategy I implemented was uh, using this PDF kit uh, Node.js library. And the next one, Earl Guten on the bottom, is an uh, Erlang library for uh, working with PDFs. So again, pattern matching here is really nice. I can, um, I can just swap the implementation without any parts of my code ever knowing that I swapped it. This clicker doesn't seem to work. Um, uh, we also include a watermark behavior, which is really a, a way to enforce interfaces. So if I'm implementing like a concept of strategies, then I want to make sure that they all adhere to the same interface so that I, you, can, you, know, you can actually just swap them around. So behaviors are a way in Elixir to let you do that. And uh, things like gen server and gen stage and all these other really nice uh, I guess concurrency primitives are all implemented with behaviors as well. So the actual logic for implementing the watermark is not really that important. But what's interesting to know is that I'm calling other languages from Elixir. Um, and um, in this case, uh, I'm calling this node script that's set up on, the, on your, app, your computer when you install this repo. And the way I do this is through a library called Porcelain which will let me safely execute other processes uh, in Elixir uh, without ever risking that that process can crash my system. So this function will call Porcelain, it will execute the script, and then it will give you back the results. Um, and now that you have this watermark layer, you can actually put it on the PDF. Um, and in the real world, you might consider doing this in S3 or what, what have you, but um, that's really not important, I suppose. Um, and um, we are also using another tool called PDFTK to merge uh, those two layers together. Uh, and again, because I'm using Porcelain, I don't have to care that um, you know, like if these processes crash, ever crash, uh, and they do, uh, that they don't affect my application because um, uh, because not, uh, none of these processes are sharing any kind of state. Uh, they are completely isolated from each other. So even if one crashes, I can restart it safely without affecting the rest of my system. <coughs> 
So if you zoom out a little bit, um, the watermarking app is really just a small little service in the grand scheme of things. And if you are building a business like you know an online bookstore or something like that, then you need to start thinking about which parts of your um, architecture needs to be highly resilient and fault tolerant. Uh, so in the case of a, an online bookstore, perhaps you watermark all of the books that you sell. So if this watermarking service goes down, then doesn't that mean that you can no longer actually deliver these books to your customers and, and your customers won't be happy? So Elixir is really designed for this kind of use case where something needs to be fault tolerant, it needs to live for a long time without ever being restarted, even if the actual logic is being implemented in, a, in another language. Elixir is really great at being that kind of like layer where you can uh, just do uh, concurrency and fault tolerance without really caring about um, the underlying implementation. So when it comes to umbrella applications and microservices in general, then uh, it might not always be very clear about where exactly the boundaries live uh, for, your, for all these little separate microservices. But as your organization scales, it's a really important conversation for your teams to have to figure out how you carve up your larger business domain and to think about what your business is really trying to solve, especially if you're a startup. Uh, and when you figure that part out, then you know, like a microservice architecture or an umbrella application is a lot simpler to build. So hopefully that gives you some real-world idea of what an Elixir application might look like. Um, the code is up on GitHub, so you can take a look at that later. Uh, but now that we have a little bit of time, I want to discover some of the other topics that I think uh, microservices really need to care about if you want to be a good microservice citizen. So to be a good citizen, you not just need to perform your intended functionality, you also need to make sure that um, you have minimum impact to other services in case of your service uh, failing over. So Elixir and its ecosystem are uh, designed to minimize these kinds of impact. And if your service is a core piece of the application, uh, so again, maybe it's like uh, you know, maybe it's part of your uh, your business where it processes payments or just something really critical like that, then high availability is absolutely critical. So uh, you'd never want to have this service go down. Um, so if you if you need to deal with things like external dependencies, which you definitely will. Uh, or if you need to just deal with parts of your system that cannot handle like a huge burst of activity, then um, rate limiting and uh, back pressure and pipelining is all first class things in Elixir as well. So rate limiting with back pressure is, uh, is really an optimization for the number of things that can run at one time. So if you figure out through trial and error that you know, your payment processor for some reason can only handle a thousand jobs at once for some reason, then you want to make sure that you always operate to that max capacity and uh, you know never go over that capacity. Um, so this is really a way for you to optimize around, uh, I guess, like other bottlenecks in your system. So earlier I showed you a very simple queue that was implemented as a separate process. Um, and here is that same queue again with uh, just a very simple interface on top of it. Um, but what's really interesting here is that this queue is now backed by um, a separate ap Elixir application that is also supervised. So when I when I start up this application, it's going to start up all these uh, children processes. So like these uh, three workers here, it will start that uh, when the application starts. So it will start a supervisor for my queue. So if my queue crashes, I will I can still uh, do work. Uh, it also starts a producer and a consumer, which I'll explain a little bit later. Uh, but these are parts of the data pipeline uh, of work that will be uh, consumed in the queue. And then we're going to start all of these children processes with the same supervisor again, just a simple one-for-one -one strategy there. Uh, so if any of these crashes, then my supervisor will just restart it for me. So the actual rate limiting and back pressure is implementing, uh, implemented in the library that's officially uh, maintained by the Elixir team called Gen Stage, a generic stage. And really, this is a library for creating producer-consumer pipelines with uh, back pressure. And back pressure just means that even though a producer might be producing items uh, more rapidly than a consumer can consume it, uh, it will ensure that only a set amount of demand will ever be fulfilled at once. So it will prevent uh, large bursts of activity from taking down your entire system. Um, the messages in my producer are then passed to a uh, processor where I do the, the work. Um, so for example, if I was going to use this queue in my watermarking application that I showed you earlier, then this is probably where I would introduce my watermarking logic. Uh, here I'm just, I just wrote a little, like, this is really just a console log and a, a sleep for five seconds. So this is just a toy example. Um, but really I would do this for um, 
parts of my app that re uh, call external processes because um, you know unless they're also implemented in a Beam language, then I cannot really guarantee that they are fault tolerant uh, and concurrent as well. So it may not necessarily be safe to run like a thousand jobs, uh, watermarking jobs at the same time. Then the consumer itself is uh, is also a supervisor. So uh, I think I don't know if I mentioned this earlier, but supervisors can also uh, supervise supervisors. So we can you know it's a, it's a tree structure, and it, because the consumer is a supervisor, it means that it can spawn dynamically spawn little processes that will run each of these jobs for me. Uh, and in this case, you can see that I, I as a naive example, I just implemented a max demand of ten. So this uh, consumer will only ever spawn ten processes at a time. And if you open up the observer, um, and here I have I recorded a little simple video, which I'm not sure if is very visible. Um, but I'm passing this queue 10,000 messages, but I could very easily pass it, you know, 100,000 or a million messages, and it will only ever run 10 at a time because I've 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 said that this is the max that I can run, so it's only going to ever run that. And if you're building a microservices that needs to do critical work, then you you want really want to make sure that this is part of your application, and you def and you really figure out where the, the bottlenecks are in your code. Uh, because if you can optimize for the number of things that you can run at once, then you can really efficiently uh, perform work. And the really nice thing about this is because um, all of these little uh, messages are being processed in separate processes. Then uh, again, if, if one of them crashes, I'm completely safe. I, will not, uh, I, I won't have to care about my whole queue uh, breaking. Uh, if one of them is being really naughty and just running forever and using all in the memory, I can just kill it as well through the observer tool. So that's kind of crazy because you, there's no way you can do this in any other language. Um, and when you build services that require high availability, then um, GenStage is a really good library to look at. Uh, next, as a microservices, uh, as a microservice, it's also really important to uh, remember that um, other services will and can uh, depend on your service to do their work as well. And if any of these, uh, if any of these services that are very heavily dependent upon go down or become unresponsive, then uh, it can have very devastating effects on the entire dependency graph of your microservice architecture. So, um, you know, like one little service that is dependent upon my ten services will now affect these ten services, which in turn have more dependencies, and you get this really like cascading failure, and and you'll be wondering like why a little typo can bring down your entire business. Uh, and your CEO won't be very happy about that. So at Netflix, we prevent these kind of scenarios from happening with a circuit breaker library called Hystrix. Uh, it has a bunch of features that are really cool, but the core functionality is that it's a circuit breaker. So if um, a command that you pass to the circuit breaker fails uh, over a specified limit within a set interval, then a circuit will be flipped, and it will so now further calls will be failed immediately, so you can handle these errors uh, instantly without. Uh, you know, like this, uh, clogging up the rest of your system. And uh, there's also reporting features and metrics built into Hystrix. Um, and again, uh, if you check out the repo, you'll see a lot more uh, explanation on why you would consider using a circuit breaker in a uh, microservice architecture. But all that to say that, you know, it's really important that you think about um, uh, circuit breakers and other kinds of uh, patterns uh, for building microservices because you really don't want to take down other services in your application. And the really great news about this is that uh, there's probably a circuit breaker library in your favorite language, uh, including Elixir. Uh, and I don't think I'm going to go through this too much because you can't see the code. Um, but it's the same idea where you, uh, you, know, you run some command that relies on some external dependency, and if that fails too often, we'll flip it, uh, and we won't call it, we will we'll avoid calling it again until a certain uh, interval has passed, and we will try it again to see if it's up, uh, up now. Um, and you can, uh, you know, if you have an eventually consistent setup, then you can recover uh, eventually when that service recovers. So uh, we've covered a lot of topics today. Um, first, I spoke to you about microservices in general, uh, and then I tried to convince you that maybe you don't need microservices uh, unless your organization is growing so rapidly that uh, your productivity is actually very negatively affected. Then we looked at Elixir. Um, I tried to convince you about its language features, its concurrency tools, its faults tolerance. Uh, I spoke about the Erlang virtual machine and its, uh, uh, the way it implements its uh, schedulers and how it does fault tolerance, process isolation, and concurrency. So this, the real takeaway here is that in Erlang and Elixir, processes, these little lightweight processes, are a way for you to organize runtime concerns. 
So um, if there's any part of your application that you know could potentially go down and you need to make sure it comes back up, then processes are the perfect abstraction for doing that uh, in Erlang because, again, these are not operating system processes. They don't have the same kind of, of I guess, bloat that an operating system process will have. These are very, very tiny processes. Um, and they can also be monitored with world-class tools uh, that, uh, so you, know, you can just ensure these things don't go down. And if you find yourself not ready to transition to uh, a true microservice architecture, then if you consider uh, Elixir umbrella applications, uh, it's a really great way to increase productivity in a rapidly growing organization without having to buy into all this really complex uh, infrastructure. Because chances are your team is probably not really equipped to do that, and it's going to be very expensive to transition uh, to this uh, architecture. So this is one of the real benefits of choosing a language like Elixir or Erlang or any other Beam language, really, if you're starting out on a new project. Um, and finally, we covered some other advanced topics. Um, what the takeaway for that is, is that if you want to build microservices, like a good microservice, then you need to make sure that uh, not only can it do what its service is supposed to do, but it also needs to be able to be fault tolerant. It needs to minimize impact to other services that depend on it. Um, and uh, really just to think about all these kind of, um, I guess, uh, these interrelationships that now that everything is a separate application. So uh, really, if you consider uh, a language for a new project, please consider Elixir and its ecosystem, because they are the first class uh, concerns for Elixir. Um, you can reach out to me on Twitter. My handle is sugarpirate with an underscore. Damn the person who took the one without the underscore. Uh, so look for me later if you have any other questions, because uh, I don't think we have microphones here. Um, so thank you all for listening. You've been great. <laughs>